welcome back to another edition of Flashback to the Track. As always, I'm James. That's Mark. He's Mark. I'm James. And we're presented by Blue Emu. Not Mark and I, but we could be presented by Blue Emu. We both use Blue Emu to provide us with maximum strength, pain relief of our tired muscles and joints. Because, Mark, I know you like to get warm and cozy in your bath with a Blue Emu warm bath pod bath time this i know you like yeah. that there's, there's nothing happens. like a blue emu recovery bath it's the best you get that like menthol smell and you just smell amazing when you get out it's refreshing your joints and your muscles feel so great it's great after you do like a hard exercise like you know running or biking or weights in the gym it's absolutely fantastic so way better than like epsom salts like throw your epsom salts away get blue emu don't put them in your recipes. That's not what it's for. But you know what I like about the bath bomb is it explodes and it's kind of cute, like a like a like a bath bomb. You know, it's there's a little more. It is fun it. when you drop it in because it like yeah. it like bubbles up and you're like, ah, oh, excellent. I feel like I'm using something from Lush instead of just you know something I got like at like my local store. You know, I feel fancy, which is nice. Baths make you feel fancy. They really do. Do you take do you take like the bath photo of like your legs poking out of the, the water like people do? Oh, I would, but you know, then it's like, oh my god, look at all the hair on his legs. And also, you know, Instagram. Yeah. You know, you've seen my calves, bro. I mean, I've got I've got some pythons for calves. I don't have I don't have you know muscles up, show muscles up up top. But like when you see my calves in some shorts, it's like, whoo, it's true. that man. It's got some calves. I, I rarely see your your calves though because you have to wear pants at the racetrack. But I mean, you don't have to. But you should. You should if you if you're dumb like me and you always like kneel places knee when pads, you're not supposed bro. to kneel. You gotta get your Mike Levin knee pads. <laughs> I used I used to have my nice mechanic wear knee pads, but you know I need like I need like some Chad Ochocinco knee pads. You know. Yeah. I need, like, so I, I used like LeBron like knee pads for a while. You know, like basketball ones. I got at like Marshalls. Yeah, but they slide down too much, like with as much walking as you do. So they didn't really work. Yeah, I feel like the football ones are better because it's more movement, maybe yeah. in football, more aggressive movement. But I don't know. You got guys grabbing you in football, like you know, guys grabbing you in basketball. Hopefully not. I mean, that's a foul, foul. But yeah, that's a cute hat. I didn't, I noticed the tread on the bottom. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I like how it's a little off center too. But yeah, why is it one new. tread? Is it like is that? The Maradness Motorcycle Gang, maybe class hat could be. It's very uh, bright. You know what it makes me bright. think of the most, and I feel like you would do this. Put a nice little Robbie Gordon number seven on it, and like say big money at Menards, bud. Yeah, put Menards on the back. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> put a put a patch on each side and, and be like, yeah, one of one Maradness hat, baby. And it's Robbie yellow Gordon and not edition. green, by the way. It's yellow, so it's it's whatever you want it to be. I think it's the the coolest color ever. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. I got one of these. I got a, like a coral red one too. They're brand new from Maradness. You can go to Maradness.com and get yourself one. And remember, if you're, in, if you're in the US, all the prices are in Canadian dollars. So your American so greenbacks will go even farther. Yeah, that number is, is less than what it really is, but not a whole lot less. It's at least like- international shipping if you spend more than 80 bucks. So. Yeah. I mean, you could save on shipping and probably save on taxes because you're buying Canadian. So you don't probably have to pay taxes on that. But enough about Maradness because they're not sponsoring this podcast. Let's talk- about racing james yeah we're gonna talk That's what about what we do on this podcast we talk about racing and today we're back to our train of talking about old races that we yeah. think are awesome and one in particular oh not just anyone in particular a one during the bush grand national division days we're talking early 2000s mark all right maybe a little too a little too far back from for some of our listeners and just far enough for others uh we're talking about the 2001 I believe it was Napa Auto Care 250 which was at Pikes Peak International Raceway mm -hmm. that's right a D-shaped oval one mile in length all the way up in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado well not really in the Rocky Mountains but it's up there in elevation which does that's always something that uh, throws curveball for a lot of these engine tuners when, when in the shadow of Pikes Peak as they say many times on the broadcast in Fountain, Colorado Peak. That's right, because it's it's not quite in the the Pikes Peak area where they have the hill climb. It's not, not all the way up there. It's yeah, we're not taking stock cars up the hill. We're we're taking them on a, on an oval. So yeah, it's an oval, but it's not as not as high up as the Pikes Peak hill climb either. So we're not that high. 
yeah. we're still pretty far above sea level though in you know in colorado so the, the flood crazy. will not get to us noah's ark is not needed in this area no. right no so let's set the stage a little bit and let's talk about this race takes place in 2001 so let's talk about the 2001 bush series season first off it's absolutely crazy here absolutely crazy Jeff Green is a 2000 champion. He's looking to defend his series championship and Wiley veteran driver, but there's all these newcomers that have come up and are like trying to make a name for himself. we got the 2000 truck series champion, Greg Biffle. He's driving in Bush now for Roush racing. We got Kevin Harvick, who's in his second year in Bush and he wants to become the champion in 2001. And we've got like our regular long tenured veterans, like, you know, Jason Keller, Randy the joy, David Green. And they're just, they're not, ready to let these young guys walk in and take the title without a fight, man. No, they're not. And it proves with this wild season so far, 13 different winners in 20 races so far. And now following the 20th race at Gateway, the points battle shaping up to be a four horse fight with Kevin Harvick, Greg Biffle and Jason Keller. Top three, Jeff Green, repeat champion. Could be. He's still a long shot in fourth, but the longest shot is Magic Shoes Mike McLaughlin sitting in fifth. He's about almost 600 points out of the points lead. He needs a miracle, but you know what? It's still a lot of racing left to go in the season, so anything can happen. But just some foreshadowing, Mike McLaughlin does not win the 2001 NASCAR Bush Series Championship. Just saying. Sorry, Mike. Thanks for He's participating. He's three races behind with 13 races to go, so he would need a lot of help. Um, yeah, I mean, you never know, man. You can make up more points back in the day. So, but that's the let's thing. talk. Yeah, let's talk about Pikes Peak, man. Pikes Peak is a cool, cool track because one, it's a NASCAR oval that's not in the South, and that's pretty interesting. But but two, it's a, a newer, more modern facility for this time period. Yeah, so it's been operating since 1996, uh, and it hosted like all kinds of different series actually throughout the 90s and 2000s. Hosted the Indy Racing League, uh, USAC, the Bush Series, the Truck Series, and AMA Superbike Racing. So it's a one mile D shaped oval, only 10 degrees of banking, James. 10 degrees of banking, but it's renowned for allowing multiple grooves of racing. So flat tracks are awesome, by the way. We love flat tracks. Flat tracks are great. Build more flat tracks. We miss we miss flat Phoenix. We miss flat Vegas. Black tracks, they're dope. Yeah, it's it's like it's kind of core racing right there. What a lot of you know drivers come up to run, running through is flat one mile tracks, shorter than a mile. So it's kind of like that bigger flat track, and it really showcases the talents of many drivers. Now this track was bought out by those good friends at in uh, International Speedway Corporation, um, and then in 2006 it was sold to a private owner. Now, NASCAR and IRL haven't raced there since 2005, but, you know, the track has hosted some events. Mark, I remember seeing a rallycross event back when GRC was in its inception days, so I'm pretty sure that exists somewhere on YouTube, but I remember seeing it at least hold a professional series race within the last 10 years. So right now, it does also offer a 1.3-mile road course configuration as well, too. I like that about tracks like this, and you mentioned Phoenix earlier oval tracks that can be repurposed throughout the year not just to be an oval track but they also have a road course as well yeah so they can host like track days autocross things like time attack you know things for amateur drivers on road courses that are a little more popular than just oval racing so yeah, plus plus you know it puts the ability to have ama you know super bikes there too man that that that's yeah. Yeah, that for in uh, new hampshire too that's another track you know that would hold up bike races as well on the road course one of these days i'm gonna go on a track day at the homestead road course it's on my bucket list i want to <laughs> drive around the homestead road course man pretend i'm a ferrari challenge driver well we'll rent a ferrari for you too mark that way it, like you can go on one of those exotic driving experiences. i can tell days. people that i'm a dentist yeah i'll take your photo and be like hey man have you seen mark drive look that's him right there and we'll just super zoom out on you and be like there he is no way or me you know what instead of that Mark, why don't we just do the Rusty Wallace racing experience? No. <laughs> let's do it. Oh, gosh. Anyways, uh, let's anyway. talk about the broadcast yeah. here. Because, Mark, this is NASCAR and NBC. But you know what? I want to put an emphasis on the B because this isn't the A team. This is probably the B yeah. team of the broadcast crew, man. So this, this race. race is away from Cup on its own on a Saturday afternoon in Fountain, Colorado. 
like 4,000 miles away from like where the cup race is or whatever. Yeah, like, the cup race is 2,000 miles away. Cup race yeah. in Pocono. So yeah. they, they gave us Rick Benjamin and nothing against Rick. I'm good friends with Rick's son, Kyle. We get along really well. Um, but Dorsey Schrader is going to be the color commentator of this race. And I don't think I've ever remember watching a Bush race that Dorsey Schrader did color for. So I've, I've seen some practice sessions. I think we might have seen a race. I don't think we've Dorsey. done one on here. Trucks for sure. I, I not... might've been that Kentucky race with David Gillen, or was that just only? No, I think no, it was Hank Parker that was, Jr. That was Tank Parker Jr. And Dorsey did practice with him. That's what it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. That's, that's kind of funny, but yeah, he, he bounced around from like, fox he did like nbc he was just everywhere you know, the, he's collecting money from everyone hey i'm i'm a voice for hire <laughs> come Same. hire me but uh in the pits man you got a legend and another legend first you got glenn jarrett uh, uh obviously at this time period he had come over from the cbs days and the uh tnt and tbs broadcasting uh days of the late 90s and early 2000s and ralph shaheen the man that will just cover anything. Uh, I don't really know if he was just like still with that tenure of TBS sports too and TNN and TBS. And he just kind of came over to Turner, but yeah, Ralph Shaheen would come on the B broadcasts. I remember at least for like the Bush series uh, with NBC, like, cause they did this race in Memphis. I think that's when they always had the B crew. You know what I mean? Yeah. Then Ralph's done all kinds of stuff. He's done like motocross. He's done like, I, I've heard Mickey his voice Thompson on everything. Yeah. yeah. We, we watched a Mickey Thompson race that he was like the pit reporter for. We, we've watched monster truck stuff where he's just there. We, he's been everywhere. Motorcycle, all, all forms of motorcycle racing. I would like to find out more about his love for motorcycle racing. Cause he seems like a very interesting guy, but yeah, that's the standalone crew for this bush series event in pike's peak because no one could be bothered to come here on a saturday they had to go stay in pocono for the cup race yeah so we talked about the broadcast we talked about the track talked about the season now we have to go into our favorite segment to set the lineup for this race it's strange starters, strange starters. what a strange person this is some strange stuff mark because one I'm going to be straight with you. I barely remember the Bush series in like 2001. I don't know about you, man. Yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, there's some really interesting drivers on this list uh, that have bounced around weird places and, and guys we know from other stuff. And we've, we've got six here. There are more in the race, but we limited it to six because we don't have all day to talk about strange starters. It's a nice round number. It's funny. You know, yeah. three. Flip it upside perfect. down. Yeah. It's a nine. Oh. And so, let's go. Mark, you go. You start. Mark. All right, let's kick us off. So the first strange star on this is Jeff Purvis. Now, you probably remember Jeff Purvis being a longtime driver for like Phoenix Racing for James Finch, and he also drove for, for Joe Gibbs. But today, he's driving the number 21 Rockwell Automation Chevy. It's one of my favorite paint schemes oh, yeah. in their series history for Richard Childress Racing. And so the 21 car was like, at this point, is RCR's second Bush Series entry. Ran a partial schedule like in all those years in the early 2000s, usually for the team's cup drivers. So in 2001, Mike Skinner was supposed to drive like about 20 races, but at Chicagoland, he was in a really bad crash and he missed a bunch of weekends. So Jeff Purvis was brought in because they guess they'd already sold this race for sponsorship. Weird that Mike Skinner would be running a race at Pikes Peak, but I guess he also ran the race at uh, Nashville earlier that year, which is a standalone race. So Jeff Purvis, they hire as a replacement. Now, Purvis had started the season at Joe Gibbs Racing in the number 18 Pontiac, but halfway through the year, after 17 races, he was let go and Mike McLaughlin was moved to that car. Mike McLaughlin was his teammate in the 20, but didn't have any more funding. But I guess Gibbs preferred McLaughlin, so they moved him and let Purvis go. Uh, So Purvis kind of out for revenge, maybe, today? Maybe? Maybe. I mean, Mike did also win at Talladega, if I'm not mistaken. He did, and they only had funding for one car from NBNA. Yeah, and, you know, go with the winner at that point. And, and Mike was, was way higher, higher in point. points, too. He's yeah, fifth so. in points at this point, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, totally understandable there. So, Purvis is driving with a chip on his shoulder a little bit here. Yeah. Next up, we've got a Wiley veteran named Joe Rutman driving 
the number one yellow freight Chevy for Phoenix Racing because James Finch only wants winners in his car. And that's why I put Joe Rutman in there. Duh. Uh, he's our second strange starter. 56 years old at this time. Whew. He is a guy who made his first ever Cup Series start back in 1963. He's been around the block and he is a really it's a really rare appearance for Rutman in the Bush series. Yeah, he's been racing cups since 1963, but he's only made uh, a handful of Bush series starts, and his last one came back in 1993. And in between then and now in 2001, did a little cup stuff, bounced around, but didn't really stick, but found a home in the truck series. In fact, in 2000, he had won two races already that season. So he's, uh, he's coming in hot, man. I'll, I'll tell you that much. It's interesting uh, that he is – Still got like a lot going for him in such his old age, but hey, Joe Rutman, and you know he's in a good competitive car. That James Finch car, especially in this point during the uh, Bush Grand National Division, was always that car that was just there to go out and win. They didn't run all the races; they always ran that partial season. But when Finch rolled up with his equipment, he was like, "We're here to do one thing and one thing only, and that's win." Yeah, Jimmy Spencer had already won in that car earlier that year at Richmond. Mm. Uh, also <laughs> says Chevy. There's no Chevy logos or headlights on that car. They don't uh, no funding when they only, they get yeah. the, the manufacturing funding. Hey, that's when they put the logos. I'm on a there. big proponent of that. If the manufacturer is like not paying you, don't put their logos on your race cars. And that's another thing too. Cause like, even at this point <laughs> in, in like, especially for the Bush series, it's always more competitive to run the Pontiacs on the super speedways. Cause they just had uh, a better drag, I think output. And they just, they cut through the air better. So you would even see Finch, and like Nemechek and a couple other Xfinity teams at that time run the Pontiacs because there was no loyalty to the manufacturer. It's like, I'm just going to run whatever's best. So yeah, I always love that to, to see guys stick it to the man like that. Also important to know, Joe Rutman won the truck race at Pikes Peak earlier that year. So sleeper, maybe Joe Rutman. Up next, we have Andy Santer, and he's driving the number 11 Channel Lock Chevy. Channel Lock's been on so many cars. Those have cool paint schemes. Oh, such and a good paint scheme. He's driving for Highline Performance Group. Now, if you've never heard of Highline Performance Group, that's the team that became Fitz Bradshaw Racing, which is featured on everyone's favorite NBS 24-7 reality show. So they later become Fitz Bradshaw. But Santer, he was a driver from Maine. Uh, and he actually did very little NASCAR racing. So he only did 68 career races in the Bush series, but he won the 1999 race at Pikes Peak, despite having very limited starts. So he's probably one of the most unexpected winners that I can remember. Like, I didn't even know he won that race. So I was doing research and I looked it up and I'm like, that's crazy. So he only ran a few races that year, but won the race. So as we said, he's driving for uh, Armando and Mimi Fitz. Uh, this is the team that was Sabco the prior year, bought out, eventually becomes Fitz Bradshaw. So Andy Santer from Maine, rare Maine driver. I always remember him in Arca in the AOL car. I think so. He, and it was always, always so interesting because he would like have this really cool corporate sponsor in Arca, which is out of place. Next up, Randy Tolzma in the number five U.S. Marine Chevy for Renzi Motorsports, a career truck series driver. Tolsmo had raced in the truck series throughout the late 90s and early 2000s, claimed two victories, one at Mesa Marin, of course, for that infamous Express Motorsports team. And his second one came at Nashville, and that was when he was driving the number 25 Dodge for Impact Motorsports. Yeah, Mark. You thought you couldn't have thought of a better name than Highline Racing during this strange starters list? Impact Motorsports right there. Dang racing. <laughs> now, uh, Randy did start the season racing in the truck series for Ed Renzi's truck team. And he actually started off the season really hot. Had four top tens, a couple top fives during the first four races and was looking good. And then the wheels kind of fell off the, the, the train there. Tracks were derailing. Things weren't looking great. Couldn't find funding. Had to fold the team. What's Red Z do? He puts uh, Tolzma in his Xfinity car or his Bush Grand National ride at this time. And he's going to put him in at Pikes Peak. Fun fact about him, this is only his second ever Xfinity Series start. In fact, his first start came a year earlier with Renzi's team. So 
at least he's jumping in with the same car owner and he's making his first start of the season as well. I forgot that Renzi had a truck team until you brought it was, that up. It was so random too. It was just for yeah. the year. Yeah. It's like when the Wood Brothers had a truck team or like with JG. Yeah, but they had, they, had, they had the U.S. Navy as a sponsor, which is so cool. But yeah. I don't think they started off with the sponsor. I think it just kind of came out, came about. It was the Air Force, wasn't it? Mm. U.S. Navy, I think it was when John Wood was at Roush, right? No, no. Oh, what was he at Roush? Yeah, when he drove the 50. I don't know if he had the Air Force on it or if it was like Motorcraft and it still had that retro 21 look. Yeah, they had boatloads. Of yeah. They had like J- they had all the JTG sponsors too. But <laughs> off topic. Up next, we've got oh, yeah. Clay Rogers. Now he's driving the number 17 Visine Chevy for Riser Enterprises. Now this is Robbie Riser's team, Matt Kenseth's Cup Series crew chief. So He's in a very interesting, strange starter because he only made 50 total starts in NASCAR's top three series between 2001 and 2014. So he originally joined Riser's team to fill in the races in 2001 that Matt Kenseth wasn't driving. And that was a really common practice at the time. It was like, you'd have a cup driver, they'd run 25 races, and then you'd have a young guy run the rest. So usually it's the races that conflict with the cup schedule, like, like speak. And they didn't, he ran these races and then he didn't go back to NASCAR until 2005, had some strong runs in the truck series with Glenn Motorsports and then disappeared, ran a race or two in 2014. And that's all we know about Clay Rogers. So he's a really strange and short career. And it's someone I've chatted with and I'm really hoping to have on the podcast at some point, because I'd love to hear about his career and why it was so sporadic the way that it was, but he uh, races his local short track like every weekend. So he's still actively racing. You big money racer on the short track side. You never know when he's going to turn up. Finally, end this list. We're going to talk about Kerry Earnhardt, driver of the number 99 Aaron's Dream Machine for Michael Waltrip Racing. Yeah, man. Remember, remember how the Dream Machine looked this season? Because it doesn't look like that at all this race. It looks like a weird DEI, Michael Waltrip, Frankenstein, Aaron Dream's machine machine thing it just it looks weird anyways uh carrie earnhardt had a limited you know uh exposure in the bush series during the late 90s made a couple of starts in 98 99 nothing really panned out went back to arca in 2000 actually scored a victory at pocono driving for dei again made a handful of starts didn't really shine really like the, like the Earnhardt way that everyone expected him to shine. Though then again, you got to remember, Kerry wasn't a spring chicken at this point either. And I don't think his career in racing was like his only thing he wanted to pursue in life. But still, he's getting a chance to drive for his dad's team and drive for his dad in ARCA, which was big. 2001, he had already made a couple of starts, didn't really pan out that well. And then he got a victory at Michigan, which was a big note to highlight that springboarded him into getting an opportunity with Michael Waltrip, who was Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s teammate at this time. Um, And this honestly probably was one of those turning points for Kerry to help him get that later Xfinity Series ride with Fitz Bradshaw Racing in 2002, driving the Supercuts car, the number 12, uh, his most notable and most infamous ride. And of course, he would later go on to make several cup starts for RCR. Um, So yeah, Kerry Earnhardt, man. He was on Dale Jr. Download recently. It's good to see that he's doing well and it's funny because like if people probably have never seen Carrie Earnhardt before but they've only seen Dale Earnhardt they might be shocked to be like wow he looks just like Dale Earnhardt dead ringer for him they look exactly the same dead With, dead got the, like the mustache he just it's it's perfect I know it's it's crazy I uh, it's it's just crazy but yeah Carrie Earnhardt's in this race it's kind of cool to uh to see that and you know like you said you go back and you connect the dots as we've said back in the past and and that this is one of those connect the dots moment, connect the dot moments that's like, wow, this probably helped springboard him to get that ride. And obviously he would go on and win two more ARCA races that year. And it probably all was good momentum for him. James, what are you doing? Bro, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, put some maximum pain relief on my like financial situation right here, man. I took a big hit this weekend on those, you know, DraftKing fantasy stuff things for this weekend at the race. Shouldn't have second guessed myself. When in doubt, pick Michael McDowell. 
So here's the thing though, James, you, you can't spray continuous spray from Blue Emu on your checkbook to relieve the pain of your finances. It's only good for giving you maximum strength pain relief for your tired muscles and joints. Oh. Well, you know what? At least it's working fast and it doesn't stink. You're right. But it kind of does stink though, because like you still have money problems. Why'd you have to remind me, man? I was just feeling better about the fast don't stink thing, man. How do I explain this to my to my landlord? Okay. So we've now reached a longer string of races for the Bush series in the summer months. We're the top bill at every racetrack. They're holding races separate from the Cup Series at Gateway, Watkins Glen, a bunch of different tracks. So we've got all the strange tires we already talked about. But we've also got some very interesting travel itineraries, especially for Kevin Harvick, who was also competing full-time in the Cup Series. Spent He had to compete at Pocono that weekend. So he practiced and qualified as number 29 GM Goodrun Chevy on Friday at Pocono, then flew on Richard Childress's plane to Colorado to race at Pikes Peak on Saturday and then fly straight back to Pocono for the cup race on Sunday, which ends up being, James, a 4,115-mile journey to run two races. Total of 750 miles of racing. And you don't have to do the math because we already did. Here's some more math for you. So this race will be 250 miles long and on a one-mile track that's a D-shaped oval makes... 250 well, laps. 250 times one, James. <laughs> what? Math. <laughs> Here's some more numbers. Kenny Wallace is on the pole with an average speed of 131 miles an hour. Now that's pretty fast, but that pace will fall off because as these drivers go on, tire fall off is big and people will be searching around for grip and just a good line to run. So we don't know uh, how that pace will look. And we also don't know how many people are in attendance either because there's no count. So it's a record sellout crowd of a million people probably watching this race live, standing room only, who knows? Probably about 40,000, it's pretty good. It's really good for that area, just for an Xfinity standalone race too. And you know what? You gotta turn up for these fans. They're coming out in droves. They look like they're having a good time. These are probably hardcore NASCAR fans who are just excited to see a NASCAR sanctioned race in their area, Mark. Yeah, man. It's a capacity 40,000. That looks like a hell of a lot of people on the, at, at the oh, track yeah. on this broadcast. It's standing room only, dude. You get one race a year, you better show up. And since Pikes Peak, James, is nearly 6,000 feet above sea level, this is always becomes the narrative when any sporting event is in Colorado, that that's going to create issues. But it can actually create issues for some of these Bush Series cars, and it can also wear on the drivers. And rather have me explain it to you, let's go to Glenn Jarrett and Darcy Schrader to hear more about it. Well, Rick, the altitude here is almost 6,000 feet above sea level. That creates some problems for the engine builders. A couple of things that they try to do. One, they may go down a couple of sizes on the carburetor jet because of the thin air. Also, to get more heat in the cylinders, they'll bump the timing up two to three degrees. Some of them do both. Uh, whatever they do, it has been determined that the engines here at Pikes Peak, because of high altitude, create about 20 horsepower less than what they normally would at lower altitudes. Uh, Dorsey Schrader, what about the drivers themselves? What kind of effect does the altitude have on them? Well, these guys are going to have a pretty long day of it, that's for sure. This racetrack, a one-mile racetrack, they got to do 250 laps around here, and every breath they take, their lungs don't get the same amount of oxygen, so they're down 20 horsepower, too. What it means, you get tired quicker, you struggle a little bit toward the end of the race. Dorsey Schrader just, just loves educating people. You know? Oh, yeah, he is. He, he'd be a teacher. He, he should be a high school teacher or college professor, excuse me, of racing knowledge, but who knows. Now, as we mentioned before, Kevin Harvick's been traveling around. That means he missed qualifying, and Ed Barrier had to qualify his car, which means Kevin's going to start from the rear. Now, this is going to be fun to watch because there's definitely going to be a lot of cutting back to Kevin Harvick in this race. That's not foreshadowing, but we'll yeah. get to see his footage, uh, well, footage of him making his way through the pack. It's going to be pretty interesting. No practice laps for Kevin either. Um, he just has to show up and drive. Just straight. Just like, hey, you know what? Maybe that's why he practice. was so good last year with no practice. Um, <laughs> so fun fact, though, James, there's 43 cars in this race. There's 32 Chevys, nine Fords, and two Pontiacs. It's just easy to make that thing a Chevy, I guess. I don't know. Maybe there's some Chevy contingency money. I don't know. There were no Dodges in the Bush Series in 2001. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's, that was really weird, you know, that Dodge was only in the Cup Series. 
That was really odd. But you know what? No love for Pontiacs? Come on, only two Pontiacs? Come on. Yeah, I think it was just Gibbs and uh, I don't know who the Gibbs. other one was. <laughs> there was only one Gibbs car, so I don't know who the other one point, was. Yeah. Honestly, I don't know. Nobody team. Who, who, who cares? Jason Jarrett. I don't know. Anyways. Uh, so, yeah, we've given you the pre-race notes, so let's jump into the race notes. You know, green flag waves and in the air and everything. Race gets started. That stuff happens. Obviously, the pole sitter is going to walk out to a lead. At this point, it's still Herminator Kenny Wallace. He's going to go get some clean air. But you know what, Mark? Talk about this Greg Biffle guy. Well, you know what? He makes a nice pass around the outside of turn two, and he takes the lead. But uh, didn't they mention in the pre-race show that he had gotten into it with some guy at another race like the previous weekend? Something like that. But it's fine. They buried the hatchet. You know, it's oh, yeah. Fine. It's all good. It's all good. Greg Biffle put that behind him. You know, I don't want him to mentally – you know, check out in this race because he has to think about that. That'd be, that'd be messed up. But you know what, Mark? It's early, but we have to know where Kevin Harvick is in the field right now. Yeah, he's in the 24th place, James, by lap 15, which means that he has passed 19 cars in 15 laps. Now, granted, most of those cars are back markers, probably flew right past them. But you know what? That's still impressive, especially with no practice. No practice passing more than a car a lap so far harvick could be to the lead soon we don't know but how about this amazing save by kevin grubb in the number 37 he gets loose on the exit of turn two but manages to make a great save keeps it out of the wall no caution but a lot of drivers are concerned about the grip during the race because during the pre-race they were like hey man you know, there, there's a lot of issues where, where it pops up through, through, the, through the race where tire, tire management, tire fall off is just a big thing. So I don't know if it's the surface. It's a hot day. Those good year tires just can't hold the grip, dude. It's definitely the altitude. It's got to be, right? Alt- altitude. It's, it's, dude, we're yeah. so high up, man. That's, that's the only thing we think. It's, it's the only thing that's different than any other weekend. Back to the front, James. Jeff Green's taking the lead in that lovely Nesquik Ford. I want to have some chocolate milk now. Just but, not Nesquik, no offense. <laughs> no, it's not very good. Don't make powdered chocolate milk. Buy the premixed stuff. Uh, but then we just lost. We're never going to get Nestle as a sponsor. But uh, uh, Biffle, okay. he stays close behind. It's a great battle between them. For, and then, there's, sorry, there's a great battle for third behind them between Tim Fidoa and Jeff Purvis. Man, those are two names that you just love hearing. Yeah. Doing well, at the front Fidoa of the field. Was getting a sh- Fido is getting a shot this race too, right? Yeah, with well, Buckshot Jones's team. Uh, yeah, but so they he's only had Pontiac. A, they That's only had funding to go through to the next race in Michigan, and that was it. And then he never appeared for them again. So, but Shrek still, now. you know, it was it was interesting that Buckshot had it was Georgia Pacific as a sponsor, and that was also the sponsor in his on his Cup ride at, at Petty Enterprise. So it's very interesting that it sponsored uh, both both rides for him. So yeah, Fido uh, looking good though early in this race. But back at the front, Biffle, he's tired of looking at Jeff Green's bumper. So he wants to take the lead. Ford versus forward battle here on lap 57. Now that Granger Ford is out front. And I got to say, Mark, Diamond Plate just does not look good on that race car. It really doesn't. No, I was never a fan. Just does not. But let's check in on Kevin Harvick. Let's take a break. We'll check in on Kevin Harvick. He's worked his way into the top 10 by lap 60 of this 250 lap Ooh. race. So he's gained 30 spots since the green flag drop. Just proves that Allen Iverson was right. And you don't need to go to practice. Uh, who doesn't need practice? Come on. But on lap 69, we get our first caution of the day. No, that's no, no, no good. The 94 of Joe Bush, no relation to Kyle Bush or Kurt Bush because it's spelled differently, people. He gets loose in turn two and backs it into the fence. That is going to be a caution. That yellow car is pretty destroyed now. Now, at this point too, Mark, it's been 69 laps. If you're the leaders, you just got to come to pit road. There's no monkey see, monkey do. Everyone just needs tires and fuel. So these crew chiefs call everybody in for four tires and fuel. Definitely make some adjustments to their cars. But during these stops, Tim Fidua, he has problems. He loses the loses like several spots and now the team is struggling to just get tires on the car does jack fail what's going on here yeah i had to get a second jack because they dropped it early and then because the, the wheel wasn't on all the way and then they had to go get the flat tire jack to get the car back up because it was too low because it wasn't sitting on the left side tires mm. and that's a shame that's for that team practice you got to practice more maybe maybe you do need to go to practice <laughs> hey mark you just said no practice now you're saying practice what the heck's going on here 
but you're you know, a legend, this, you don't need to practice. But yeah. uh, well, this is not the first time we'll see this during the race, and it's unfortunate that it bit Tim's team already so early. But we'll see if they'll be able to bounce back. But we're gonna get back to racing. Mark lap seventy-five. Green flag. Green flag. It's going across the, in the air. Woo! Field gets fanned out across the track, and we've got great side-by-side racing throughout the field. And in the action, Jeff Green takes the lead back, but not for long because his teammate Jason Keller in the Albertsons Ford gets by him on lap 85. Uh, Nice mustache on Jason Keller there. At that point, Jason Keller's mustache was incredible. Like, there were some great mustaches that year, man. 2001. Take me back. I'll just be honest. Jason Keller's mustache is one of the most underrated mustaches in NASCAR history. Just hands down. Like, people forget about the fact that he had a mustache in the late 90s and early 2000s. So, yeah. That was that's fun facts there. We're stating facts here on this. We always uh, got time for mustache facts. But we got to get back to Kevin Harvick. Watch, James. Kevin we got, we got to. But you know what? We're going to take a quick break from the, all the action since we're already taking a break talk, talking about mustaches. We're going to go to our boy, Ralph Shaheen. And he's got a story about a very cute sponsor. Andy Santer this week. Rob Shaheen, I understand Andy Santer has picked up some uh, significant new backing this weekend. Is that right? Well, Rick, as regular followers of the NASCAR series, you're common to seeing big-time Fortune 500-style sponsors involved in NASCAR's Winston Cup and Bush Series. Well, let me introduce you to two of the newest sponsors in NASCAR's Bush Series, helping out their favorite driver, Andy Santer. They heard he needed some money, so Catherine Newcomb and her younger brother Samuel, ages five and four, sent in their piggy banks to Andy and some notes saying, Andy, we would like to do anything we can to help you. Now, Catherine, how much money do you think you sent Andy here today? Uh, maybe ten equal. Ten dollars. Well, that'll go quite far. And Samuel, why is Andy Santier your favorite driver? He sent his piggy bank to him. That's why <laughs> these two youngsters are originally from Maine. Of course, that is the home state of Andy Santer. And they heard about Andy needing some sponsorship help. So, like good kids, they sent their piggy bank to help out their favorite driver. And I got to tell you, Rick, it's the first time I've ever had to wake somebody up to do an interview with him. <laughs> Old Samuel was crashed out on the media room floor. I can understand. It is a hot, sunny summer afternoon. Here at- God, Mark, children are our future. They are our they future. They do not know how to spend their money. God. No. Do not she wasted all of her money. with your piggy bank. That's a ter- Do not invest in motorsports with your oh. piggy bank. It, you, it, it's not investing. It's throwing your money away, little well, girl. As okay. the old adage says, if you're a billionaire and you want to become a millionaire, buy a race team because you will be down to millionaire real quick. But like I said earlier, we got to get back to Kevin Harvick watch. And at the halfway point in this race, he's running in the seventh position, but he's kind of settled in. And he's just battling with the cars around him. He can't move up any higher than that. Maybe struggling with some tire dag or something. But, you know, I mean, they just don't quite have the setup right. But the fact that he's made it all the way up to seventh is pretty impressive uh, in its own right. No, nah, dude, those tires equalized. He's equalized. He can't, yeah. Uh, it's impressive that he's made up that, that many positions so far. But, you know, it only gets harder the higher up you get in the running order. Speaking of higher up in the running order, Jason Keller is still our leader. But Jeff Purvis is hunting him down. Now within two tenths of a second per lap faster than Keller's lap times. Purvis is on course. But of course, NBC uh, and the stands have nothing but commercials to present for us, Mark. In fact, didn't we see some commercials for the best way to spend your Monday night watching want list and fear factor or whatever that, that show was fear factor was on first man. I don't know how to spend my Monday nights watching fear factor at eight o'clock on NBC. The main point here is that we didn't get to see the pass for the lead because we were seeing fear factor commercials. Just like now there was one pass for the lead and we didn't get to see it because we were seeing commercials, but don't worry. We come back and well, we were away. Here's a replay. Here's a replay. We always get to see the best moments on replay. It's funny because, like, at least nowadays there is side by side. Thank God for IndyCar for that. If if IndyCar ever did anything amazing for motorsports, it was side by side coverage. But like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, Mark. I needed to know when Fear Factor was going to be on. Man, this is Joe Rogan when he had hair, dude. Come on, you gotta can't miss that. So they make up for it though on the broadcast later on because we get treated to just 
the greatest camera angle that you never see anymore. James, you shared a video of this not long ago on your social where suspension cam, we got a camera in the wheel well looking at Greg Biffle's suspension while he drives around the racetrack. It's the coolest thing ever, and I wish they'd do more of it. And I just stopped love- doing it like mid-2000s. Oh, no, they did. I guess the competitive advantage is hard to not expose at that you know, angle. I get it. But I always love how much effort the marketing person had to go through to put all of the sponsor logos and every little nook and cranny they could on the undercarriage of the race car for this camera. Like, I don't know how many Granger logos need to be there, but there are too many. Yeah, and I'm and just, just saying that. When did they stop doing this? Because I remember seeing it on Regan Smith's car at Dover in 05, and that's the last time I can remember seeing it. That's, I, I would, I would want to say like they, they did it a few times in the last like 10 years, but I can't name them off yeah. the top of my head. I was glad they brought the track cam back at a, at a recent race, the track-level camera. But Mark, at, uh, you know, yeah, Daytona Road Course. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the, and then this past weekend too, another road course. But I will say the camera that tops that camera – is the front bumper camera. I forgot who's carrying it in this race, but what? Come on, that track side perspective looks so nice. And plus, especially on those like noses from like the early 2000s and mid 2000s, they were so sharp back then. It's such a great angle. But while we're looking at Biffle's suspension, we really get to see like the subtle bumps these cars drive over, like even on these like, you know, smooth race tracks. And we also get to see that Biffle's really struggling with a loose condition and he's starting to slide back through the track, uh, through the pack, sorry. And uh, he actually makes contact with the outside wall, kind of takes him out of the race. He just, they couldn't fix that loose condition uh, on on that number 60 Granger Ford, unfortunately. No, but you know what we do get as the green flag is still out, you get green flag pit stops and that cycle starts at lap 155. And these could be the final stops of the day. You can make it from the, from here to the end of the race on fuel though you will probably have a set of tires left over just in case that caution comes out so you could always do that if need be come back in and get some fresh rubber but let's get some more insight on the strategy from the man on top of the pit box for jeff purvis gil martin lead and we've got less than 90 miles to go but jared what's the situation on pit road well, we've got a lot of cars coming in right now. Uh, Kenny Wallace, the pole sitter, is in. I see the double zero car uh, up ahead of him. Of Jeff Beatle. Let's talk to Gil Martin. He's the crew chief on the leading car, Jeff Purvis. Gil, you're having a great run. A lot of cars are coming in now. When are you guys due to stop? Uh, we're going to stop in about five or six laps, about lap 167. Uh, Jeff's doing a great job in his Rockwell Automation car today. It's been pretty good all weekend. And we'll stop here in about seven laps and go the whole way. I can't imagine you're going to make any changes to this race car. I don't think so. We were a little bit loose at the beginning of the run, but the car comes in after about 30 laps. Okay, guys, somewhere around lap 170, we should see the leader, Jeff Purvis, in the pit. Man, Gil Martin's been crew chief in forever. I can't believe he's Gil crew chief in back 2000. Anyways, uh, it's going to end up being uh, a good stop for the 21 crew as they get in and out of pit road as the leader. And, in fact, they're going to gain a, a, a lead up of eight and a half seconds with 70 laps to go. If the caution doesn't come out, Mark, I don't see how Jeff Purvis could be caught at this point. Yeah, uh, they actually spent the least time on pit road the entire race. So that's that's how you win races, man. Yes. Least time in the pits. Like, this is a team sport. And while Jeff Purvis might be putting a whooping on the whole field, like he's got a, like an eight and a half, nine second lead at this point, there is great battling back to the pack. They go four wide off turn two as Jimmy Johnson is trying to pass three lapped cars that are battling for position. That's right, Jimmy Johnson's in this race, driving that number 92 Exedrin Chevy. We didn't include him in strange starters because, you know, he wasn't really strange at this time. He was a full-time, you know, series driver, so. No, no, he, he wasn't. He, he, this is, he's just doing his thing. But also during that cycle of pit stops, another car that falls off the jack in just a painful way is Chad Little's number 74, uh, staff america car uh for i believe it's base motorsports the base motorsports team that won all those championships in the mid 90s and it's just painful to watch mark because like first the jack fails then they just get something to pry under the car to try to get it underneath and it, it's just a whole painful process even before like the car falls off the jack it's trying to get away and then the tire falls off the car it's just it's a bad sight man i didn't uh, looking at it again makes me just cringe. On a happier note, we get a great battle between Andy Santer and Bobby Hamilton Jr. back in the pack for 12th position. So the director is doing a great job giving us this, 
this other these other elements while Jeff Purvis is just out absolutely destroying everyone. And they even keep us entertained with some great technical segments like this one. Dorsey Schrader is going to teach us about wheel camber. You know, you talk about these cars being tight and loose and so forth. This is a term we always use about camber on the wheel, our negative cameras they put in the front of these cars. This is what that is, folks. The camera on the wheels, when you look at the wheel, it's tilted in. You tilt it in, and the reason for it being the contact that what meets the road, it looks like that when you're in the straightaway. But when you come on that banking, see what happens? It goes all the way across. You get all that rubber on the racetrack. gives you a lot more grip. Helps the car turn into the corner and then drive off the corner on the straightaway. See, he, just, he should just be teaching either a high school level or, or community college level I, class I, about everything about racing. I would take an auto shop if Dorsey Schrader was the teacher. He's, he's, he's the technical advisor of NASCAR Technical Institute right now. Meanwhile, Jeff Purvis is already lapped up to the 10th place driver mark. That's right. Basically, anyone inside the top 10, you better look out because Tim Fiedewa has fallen off the lead lap. No one is safe from the 21 Rockwell, Rockwell Automation Chevy. You know, it's funny, Mark. I feel like they're really selective about the drivers they wanted in that car. They... Like, that's probably why they wanted Skinner in this race. They're like, no, nah, we really want Skinner. We don't care if you can get anybody else. We, we want a winner. We don't even care if it's just at Pikes Peak. We want to win. So, but you know what's funny? Richard Childress is actually in attendance for this race. It's kind of interesting. He made the trip out to Pikes Peak. And you know what? We get to hear from Glenn Jarrett, who's uh, hanging out with Richard. He gets the scoop about his trip. Uh, just to watch Kevin Harvick race. Well, I think so, uh, Rick. That, you know, we showed you the official father-in-law of the 21 car. Of course, that would be Richard Childress. Richard, I know you came out here to watch uh, Kevin Harvick from Pocono, but, man, your other driver is putting on quite a show. He's got a half a lap lead. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff and uh, Gil Martin, all the guys on the Rockwell car is doing a great job. Kevin is, too. We just missed it a little bit here. and uh, But, you know, we'll see how it ends up. You got to be awfully proud of him. The purpose is making a strong case for somebody to put him in a race car full time. Yeah, Jeff's a good driver. I tell you, we we looked at him when he got out of that ride. They wasn't a question who we were going to put in the 21. Well, they certainly made the right choice here today. Uh, you and Kevin heading back to Pocono as soon as this is over. Yeah, as soon as it's over, we'll head out. All right. Good luck to you tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, and you know what? I would say at this time, nobody better than Richard Childers as a team owner at traveling to races. Like, if you watch truck races from the mid-90s, Childers is at almost all of them, even if they're in weird places, watching his drivers race. Because Jay Sauter and Mike Skinner in those days in the truck series are competing for championships. And, you know, Richard wanted to be a part of it. So Richard traveled with Kevin on his on his plane from Pocono. Just kind of made such a go for a ride. Let's just we'll go to Colorado for the day. You know, why not? We'll I think it's... I think it's also too, it's smart as an, in a business standpoint when you buy the planes, because then you can also charter the planes out for other people. Cause that's something kind of what RCR does and, or probably did for a bit. I know Earnhardt did for a while too. So it's like, Hey man, I own this plane. I'm just going to fly it out. Whatever else, pay the jet fueling fee, pay for the pilot. Cool. Sounds like a plan. So when you're that high up, man, you do whatever you want. But meanwhile, I'm pretty sure uh, RC is enjoying this trip out here because at this point, Purvis is dominating the field. I mean, he's pretty much almost got a 15-second lead on the field. And then you got Kevin Harvick right now running down Jeff Green for second. We're sitting at third. He could have a one-two day at the end of it. Let's see how things shape out in the final three laps, man. Uh, I don't think anyone's going to touch Purvis, though, but this yeah. battle for second is heating up. Harvick's closing in on Green. Green's hug, hugging that bottom, but Harvick's just finding something up top. That's a great thing about these multi-groove racetracks, man. There's different lines that you can try, and unfortunately for Kevin Harvick, he can't get it to work. Jeff Green holds on a second. Jeff Purvis sails to a margin of victory of 15 seconds over the rest of the Can you imagine that? Like this close but driver was more than half a lap behind. The, the, the real battle, Mark, was for seventh. That seventh-place driver, Kevin Grubb, Stayed on the lead lap in his number 37 Chevy. Way to go, Kevin. He's on the lead lap at the end of the day, Mark. Take that. Or was it eighth? I can't remember. Seventh or eighth. He, he, was, he was on the lead lap. but He was on the lead lap. And so was Jimmy Johnson. Take so that. So was Jimmy Johnson. So was Who Jimmy had just Johnson. won a few weeks prior. Chicago um, if you didn't know, they mentioned it several times in the broadcast. Of course. <laughs> This yeah. is a massive win uh, for Jeff Purvis. So he had lost his Joe Gibbs racing ride a few weeks earlier, like we said. And it was his first Bush Series win in five years. He had won since 1996. And it was the first win for RCR's number 21 team. 
Yeah. The B team winning the B race. And I love how Ralph Shaheem has to put Gil Martin on the spot too during Jeff's victory burnouts. Oh, it looks like he landed himself a full-time ride. I don't know about um, that there, Ralph. Jeff Purvis would appear in this car, I believe, just one more time. One more time, yep. Yeah. And that was it. I mean, it did help Purvis's stock because he would, I believe, get the 37 ride the next year. Yep, and he won a race at Texas. Yep. So, so I mean, unfortunately, he would uh, end that season uh, like with a, with a very bad accident at, I believe it was Memphis or was it at Nazareth? I believe it was uh, Nazareth. Nazareth. It was in Nazareth, yeah. Yeah, and he would never come back in the Bush Series, I believe. So. Oh, he, he came back in 2003 for one race at Nazareth with James Finch. That's right. He stuck it to time. Nazareth. Exactly. And uh, Jeff Purvis actually ran all four of the restricted plate races in 2001 in Cup for, for James for, Finch. Yep, for Finch in a number 51 yeah. Ford. Yeah. Oh, we've got all the fun facts today. We do. The and there was fun, no Ford stickers on that car either. Well, there folks. was not, but there were subway stickers on a car with white – uh, white car with red numbers yeah uh, i remember i think that was at Tal- the second talladega race it might have been at the daytona race too <laughs> i think it was the daytona 500 and it was disgusting but the best uh, part of this race is the victory lane celebration they douse purvis with bush beer like that's one oh, of the yeah. craziest celebrations i've ever seen in victory lane because you know what enjoy yourself because you never know if you're gonna win again that's the yes thing. that was that was a whole group uh, you know, you got to see the young energy from that group enjoying their first victory. Jeff Purvis climbing back on top of the mountain. You know, just a feel-good story all around, man. But, Mark, after all this racing and all this elevation, what did we learn? Well, we learned a couple things. I think the first thing we learned is that races can still be fun and entertaining with few cautions and dominant race cars. There's a 15-second margin of victory in eight cars in the lead lap. But this was a fun race, James, and very enjoyable to watch. Yes. You know what? I learned you're never too young to invest in racing because if you throw your money at it and you're a child, I'm pretty sure the news media outlets would love to hear your story. But it was great to see that, you know, a little girl and a little boy got to come out to a race at Pikes Peak and cheer on their local driver. And also, tracks like Pikes Peak should come back on the the schedule. I hope, you know more short tracks, more flat tracks are on the schedule because they're entertaining. So what if sometimes the margin of victory doesn't seem as close as it should be and you can't manipulate the race? The racing is the racing. And this is racing that a lot of drivers grew up doing. It's not foreign to them. It's actually fun to them. It's just all about who brings the best race car to the track. And in this race, it was evident that the 21 team had the best car. B team showed up and they dominated. What could have been if Kevin Harvick had practice, but still, what a performance by Kevin Harvick in 2001. You cannot deny his abilities in not only just the Bush Grand National Division, but the Cup Series to run both series the way he did and be successful claiming the championship this season the way he did. Amazing stuff. And you know what? Just a lot of great names in this race, man. A lot of great names to check out again. You have Jeff Green, Randy LaJoy, uh, Magic Shoes, Michael McLaughlin. You also had Tolsma in there you could have talked about. Uh, Earnhardt was in there for a couple of times. I mean, they showed him, especially at the end when he was almost going to lap down. No offense. I'm sorry. It was just a very uh, attrition filled race. But I mean, man, even when we talked with Brent uh, about how awesome it was just to see all the cool corporate sponsors on the cars back in this period of time, the Aqua Velva car, the Nesquik car, Toys R Us car, Little Trees car. It was so cool to see that. I wish we could see more of that with these independent teams in the Xfinity series today. But, uh, you know, we're starting to see it again, man. I feel like the Xfinity series is going to pop again like it was back in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s. Well, and the consensus is that, you know, the Xfinity series is the best series in NASCAR right now. Oh, yeah. People are saying. So, you know, um, this is a good race, though, man. Like, sometimes it's just fun to watch somebody dominate because you're – it's mixed feelings because you're like, wow, this is boring because, like, one guy is just smoking everyone. But I remember Mm -hmm. watching an IndyCar race at Long Beach a few years ago, and Alexander Rossi, I think he led every single lap. There was no cautions. And it was enjoyable. It was like, this is great. You're watching this guy destroy everyone. Like, that's so cool to see how much better he is than everyone else. So that's cool, you know, especially Jeff Purvis to show up with this team. And, you know, another bummer for Mike Skinner, though. Like, he got hurt, 
And then like Robbie Gordon gets his car and he wins the race at New Hampshire at the end of the year. And then he loses this car and Jeff Purvis wins. It's like, poor guy. Yeah. I mean, I feel like Mike in 2001, it could have been like more of a make or break season where he could have like really shined and probably broke through that glass ceiling, getting that first victory in a cup car. And it probably would have transcended over to the Xfinity car. That's probably why he was running more Xfinity races too, or Bush races at this time period too, to get like more of that confidence for the cup series. But Man, it is a shame because, you know, like you said, he just gets hurt. I believe it's uh, – it was like he had a practice crash and then he had a, a crash in the cup race too, and it just – both of those were really bad for him, and it, he was out. I think he had like a knee or a shoulder injury. Yeah, remember. so in the cup race at Charlotte, I think he, he uh, broke his foot, tore his ACL, and had a concussion. Um, so – because that was a hard lick. Like, he was running fourth at the time, blew a fright front, just blew out, and like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's tough to watch, but – yeah, bummer for him, but you know what? It was a great, great day for Jeff Purvis. You know, this is this exactly. is like a feel good race, James. Oh yeah, Purvis is a journeyman. You know, a dirt track mm-hmm. racer, uh, hooked up with Finch. Was you think about his career? What could have been with him and and Neil Bonnet? Bonnet coming in and making that Cup program for Finch, and Purvis was probably in line to get that ride after Bonnet had established that team and he could have been a mentor to Purvis and really taught Jeff a lot about asphalt racing and cup racing, but what could have been there. And then has like this journeyman's career throughout the nineties running for Finch in the cup series and the Xfinity series and an Arca and still running dirt track races, you know, and just never having the success in the pinnacle series, but he finally gets it in these later years, which is great for him. Always feeling good about a Jeff Purvis win, man. Oh, yeah. Feel, feel, feels. If you're feeling any kind of tension or pain, achiness, muscles or joints, feeling tired, hit that with some blue emu. I mean, you can do it with this wonderful continuous spray. You know, it just it likes to do this clicky thing. Ooh. Love that sound. Oh, yeah. I love that sound because when, when you do that, you've activated. You know relief is just a moment away. Oh, yeah. It's like, and then you spray yourself with maximum strength relief in a continuous form that works fast and it doesn't stink, which is nice because I like things that work fast. I don't like to stink, Mark. I'm with you there. But, James, we forgot something. We got to give the race a rank out of 10. Oh, man. What would you give this race out of 10? I'd give it. Well, be honest, uh, the biggest thing that tracks from it is the, the quality upload we watched is really bad. The VHS is bad, but I'll give it a, uh, I got to give it an eight because, you know, it's got the, the fuel from Metallica at this point in time with NBC, which always makes the broadcast awesome. doesn't matter if it's B crew that's doing it. You still get the fuel. Give me fuel, give me fire, which is awesome. Um, really great paint schemes. I like also that uh, Jeff Purvis's brake duck was slanted weirdly on the front of his car. Um, and there was an abundance of Chevys, which was weird, but awesome at the same time too. So yeah, I got to give it an eight. Eight's good. Feel I'm good also, also going to give it an eight. So it's a feel good story. Jeff Purvis gets the win. Uh, like you said, amazing paint scheme. So many sponsors, a James Finch car with, with no logos and no headlights. Like that's awesome. Um, and just yellow transportation. Chevy Chevy domination yellow transportation which is orange um but why is yellow orange dot com exactly yeah I remember right. reading why it's an interesting story but um just because they only had the paint it's exactly. like Richie Evans with his modifieds so I gotta give it an a it's a it's a great feel good story Jeff Purvis gets the win you know kind of redemption for him unfortunately he didn't really his career didn't last much longer than that unfortunately that wreck he had in Nazareth but yeah. you know. It was it was great to see him get this win, and it's not his last win. He wins again the next year at Texas in a rain shortened race. I want to go still, watch that race now. Yeah, it's an interesting one. So his finishes all that year were not great. It's like 27th, 29th, 31st, and you look at his Wikipedia, and it's like win, and then like the next race, 27th, 29th, like until until he has his accident. So it's it's an interesting year, but you know what? You got potential to the weather radar, folks. You know they have that stuff on the pit box, so you got to know when to stay out. Exactly. But yeah, Eight out of 10, for sure. And Kevin Harvick's story is really cool, you know? And that becomes more common as the years go on. And like 05, 06, guys like Carl Edwards and all kinds of drivers running both series, traveling all over the world, you know, uh, to run these races. 
So yeah, it's think how foreign it is at this time for him to be doing it. And like when, you know, I don't know, six years, seven years down the line, you have Kyle Bush just flying everywhere, driving in a truck and an Xfinity car and a cup car. Like, yeah. Going from Sonoma to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, like, you know, yep. like a day apart. So it's crazy. But, and the Milwaukee race was a night race too on the Saturday and he had to be in Sonoma on Sunday afternoon. Or yeah, like when he's got to go to a truck race, it's all the way in the, all the way in Texas, and then he's got to fly back to like it got uh, his cup race in uh, Pocono. You know, like he didn't care. Like he was vested, and it's cool to see drivers like that. I like yeah. to see drivers like it's that. It's like a throwback, you know. It's cool to see guys flying all over the place and going to different races and and doing different things. Like, I think yeah. a guy that does that now that doesn't get enough credit is Ryan Priest, man. Like he yeah. does a lot of good modified running, racing. Running is modified. Yeah. yeah. He, he goes all I mean, we were at Speed Weeks, like we saw him in New Smyrna, like right after. Now granted, that's only a 20 minute drive from Daytona, but still to run so your cup car and practice all day and then go run a modified at night when you don't have to, you know, like it's pretty cool. And even this past weekend at Sonoma, Cody Ware ran the uh, mid Ohio Xfinity race and then flew to Sonoma the next day to run the cup race, and he was the only driver that drove both. So, you mm-hmm. know, 10 years ago there would have been 20 drivers that ran both. So kind of cool to see that it is really cool you know got more multifaceted drivers well i think that's gonna do it james it's a short but sweet episode of the flashback to the track podcast with a nice race review for you back to our roots you know doing race reviews that's right that's what the people love maybe maybe we'll go a little mid 2000s next time definitely maybe maybe yeah I always think, well, I remember we were discussing this. We discussed maybe doing the 2005 Pikes Peak race just because yeah. the strange starter potential was unreal. The race isn't very good, but the strange starter mm-hmm. potential was sick. Uh, we could have just done strange starters for an hour, but, you know. I like their strange starters here because, like, you know, Randy Tolzman's so fun. Like, damn, how how how, how we got that ride. So crazy. Uh, obviously, how Purpose got, got this ride here. Um you know, guys like Andy Santer, Clay Rogers. I mean, th- those are some good names. And obviously, you know, it's always good to find a drop to find an Earnhardt to drop in there. And when Kerry's in a race, it's always it's nice to, to talk about him in some way. So it's always, always good. You know, I thought that was a good race, man. Mm-hmm. You had fun. It was good. List. It was, it was, good script. It was, it, was, it, was a, it was a fun watch and that'll do it for this weekend, for this week of the flashback to the track podcast. Stay tuned for cool stuff coming on our YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, always, like I say every week, check out the stuff over on Blue Emu's social media accounts. You can follow Blue Emu at Blue Emu One. James is doing all kinds of cool stuff. Like you can vote every week for the Blue Emu maximum strength move of the race. And you can also vote every week for which driver you think needs relief. And Blue Emu will send them a box of relief after the race. So follow Blue Emu on social media on both Twitter and Instagram at Blue Emu One. And you can follow both of us, our Links to our social media are down in the description below if you're watching on YouTube. So thank you very much for taking the time to have us as part of your lives. Yeah. Let us in, letting us into your home, your your airwaves, wherever they may be, your car, could be your dorm, could be your girlfriend's dorm. If so, kudos to you. Put a sock on the door. And that'll do it. Bye. Bye. Have a great night.